<clears throat> okay, Panini and Schlaun, two, two architects, one Italian, one German. And the only connection between them really is the fact that um, they both died on the 21st of October. And today is the 21st of October. So it's an occasion um, suggested to us by fate to talk about both. Uh, Giovanni Paolo Panini or Paninini, as you can see, he, he, he died on the 21st of October, 1765, uh, <clears throat> was a painter and architect who worked in Rome and is primarily known as one of the Vedutisti, view painters. As a painter, Panini is best known for his vistas of Rome, in which he took a particular interest in the city's antiquities. Among his most famous works are his view of the interior of the Pantheon on behalf of Francesco Algarotti and his vedute, paintings of picture galleries containing views of Rome. Most of his works, especially those of ruins, have a fanciful and unreal embellishment characteristic of capriccio themes. In this, they resemble the Capricci of Marco Ricci. Panini also painted portraits, including one of Pope Benedict XIV. Uh, he lived at the, at the time when, uh, when uh, Piranesi was alive. Piranesi was born in 1720. So, uh, you know, 29 uh, years after Panini, but when Panini died in 1765, uh, Piranesi was already a, a known uh, uh, architect and engraver or etcher. He was then 45 years old. So let's see some works by uh, Panini, by Giovanni Paolo Panini. Um, here he was. You know, th these portraits amuse me because, because these people are so different from us or they were so different from us, you know? And, and I wonder why shouldn't we dress like this man, for example? I mean, you know, not to copy him, but in this more romantic, uh, you know, even flamboyant with uh, velvets and, uh, you know, I am not a fan of, uh, of wigs, although I might need one, but but it's it's something I, I think we are too gray, you know, too in a way too unimaginative. You know, what if what if you know uh, begin again to uh, you know to find the pleasure there where no one would uh, search for, and uh, you know again you know imagine at the order of architects I don't know which uh, uh, filiale. Uh, uh, an architect, uh, you know, looking like uh, Paninini would show up one day, you know, maybe to pay his uh, tax or uh, to attempt to pass an exam, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, you would say that I'm not serious, but uh, I think I think we are restricting ourselves too much and we are not letting our imagination fly. and. Uh, and uh, the results are, uh, you know, apathy, uh, boredom, uh, maybe even uh, depression or uh, despair. Anyway, let's see. Look, <laughs> you know, this was an architect and he painted this. You know, this is a horror vacui painting. I mean, there is no square inch here that is uh, free. Everything is covered. I mean, just imagine this man painted paintings within the painting and not just paintings, but also sculptures. You recognize here Moses by Michelangelo and here you see David and uh, God, you know, uh, it's the whole history of, uh, of art until his time is here. Uh, and, and you say, you know, what is this nonsense? But this so-called nonsense is, uh, is the desire of, of man to, to oppose to uh, the ephemerality of life, art. 
And uh, I remember there was a, an interview with David Bowie and David Bowie uh, uh, asked himself, why, why do we need culture? Why, why can't we just, you know, uh, well, he was polemical, but uh, he said, why, why do we need several kinds of uh, plates? And why, why do we need uh, all kinds of inventions when we can just function, you know, in simple, simple ways and so on. But uh, this is not possible, really, because, because I think uh, Paul Klee, the great Swiss uh, painter, was right when he said, uh, and I, I, I forgive me if you heard me you know, mentioning this quotation from Paul Klee, but it's one of my favorite quotations, that there are two mountains, the mountain of the animals, they, that, uh, those that do not know, they do not know, and the mountain of the gods, they who know, they know. And then between these two mountains is the crepuscular valley of man, they who know, they do not know. And it's exactly because we know we do not know that we generate cultural activity. If you are an artist, of course, you are interested in art. If you are a scientist, you are interested in science. Sometimes the scientist is also interested in art, even with fervor. Sometimes the artist is uh, interested in science, uh, the poet like Goethe and others. So, you know, what we see here is the product of imagination. But we need this, you know, uh, even if it seems uh, almost ridiculous, you know, to gather so many paintings in one huge room it makes one think of Citizen Kane, a uh, uh, very important uh, North American film, and uh, North America is not quite able to create uh, uh, truly great films uh, besides the commercial ones from Hollywood. But this one, Citizen Kane uh, by uh, Orson Welles, is a very good film and is considered the best North American film ever by the Film Academy of the United States. Anyway, there is about uh, is, is described the case of a, a, a tycoon, a very rich man who collect, was a, an, an avid collector. So what do we see here? We see some collectors at the bottom, uh, you know, uh, uh, exploring uh, the artificial. Well, should I call it artificial? The otherness the other world, the world of art, as opposed to the world of nature. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's an art gallery of huge dimensions, but it's an art gallery that uh, shows, uh, you know, masterpieces of all times, you know, like here, for example, uh, uh, sorry, um, I, I clicked on something. Um, anyway, this was done by Paninini, by Panini. And uh, you can tell he, I mean, no, no, you cannot tell he was an architect, but you see most paintings show buildings. So you could say he was a frustrated architect who couldn't build, so he painted, painted buildings, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, everywhere you see paintings, paintings with buildings. And of course, then you have sculptures and so on. Anyway, let's move forward. The interior of the Pantheon Rome, also a painting from 1734. In, in, 19, in 1734, the great Piranesi was 14 years old. So he didn't yet begin, I guess, his uh, great activity as a nature. The Pantheon. Uh, you know, what do we see here? You know, where is the grave of Raphael? the great painter, the, I don't know exactly, although I should because I was at the Pantheon and he's buried there. Um, I have to tell you by the way of the Pantheon that uh, one winter many years ago, I went to Rome to make a film uh, for an experimental school in the United States. Well, actually it was for me with Christmas in Rome. So I went first to San Pietro in Rome uh, and uh, I was disappointed by the pomp uh, and uh, I didn't truly really feel that uh, I didn't have that uh, Christmas feeling, so to speak. So I left disappointed uh, and uh, I came to the Pantheon and at the Pantheon, 
uh, I felt a little better. It was close to midnight. And I noticed in this hole, the Oculus, it was very dark. I mean, there were many people. It was uh, Christmas Eve, and there were many people gathered here. Although the Pantheon is, is, is not a Christian uh, locus, but, uh, you know, the Romans uh, gathered there to, you know, celebrate uh, Christmas Eve. And I noticed here in the Oculus, uh, some white dots moving, and I didn't know what they were. And um, I forgot, either I myself arrived at the conclusion, or, or uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 um, I learned somehow that, uh, or somebody told me that they were pigeons. Uh, pigeons, that it was almost midnight, it was dark outside, and, uh, you know, we, we, we usually we don't think of a building having a big hole, you know, because through here, the snow comes downwards and the, and the, and the rain. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I couldn't imagine that some pigeons would just fly in that, um, you know, circled uh, darkness. Anyway, this is like a, like a little story connecting uh, with, uh, with the Pantheon. Uh, but you see that Panini was interested in showing uh, the, the majesty of architecture, and then human beings in various postures, uh, you know, uh, I, I cannot say encapsulated by the great building, but uh, the great building, I mean, architecture is kind of, uh, yeah, containing uh, the dynamics of life as lived by all of us and as, as it was lived always. Now, St. Paul preaching in Athens in 1734, the National Gallery of Art, uh, a drawing, you know. Uh, I mean, th these artists drew very well. And I, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, my contemporaries, uh, and I am one of them, uh, we, we do not, they don't, and we don't, we don't draw like this any longer. It's, we, we are so can't. I mean, it's not only that we don't want to, we, we, we can't. <laughs> That's the truth. If, if you look at the drawings of Bjarke Ingels, and you look at this, you realize that there are, you know, uh, there is a great distance between the skill that this kind of drawing involved involved and then and, and, you know where we are today we, we 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 don't believe in this kind of drawing and the question is why what happened to the world if, if you look at the sketches of frank gary and not just him you know they are just uh, uh, you know there is this uh, romanian word uh, no i shouldn't use it actually but something happened we don't believe any longer maybe because of the camera it's possible you know, the photography had an, uh, a role in this, you know. Why would one draw like this when you have a camera and you can take pictures, you know, where you can see uh, anything in detail and uh, very well, uh, you know, represented and so on. Anyway, uh, Roman Capriccio, the Pantheon and other monuments. This one is, uh, what can we say, you know? <laughs> What we, what we can say is that there is no car here. There are no cars. And this is distinctly different from our time, from our cities. Was, was Rome at that time when Panini lived like this? Uh, it's maybe this is, um, I mean, yes, the, the, the buildings are recognizable. But for example, this statue, was supposed to be in Campidoglio, uh, in, the, in the, that square that, um, that uh, Michelangelo designed. And not here, not certainly not in the proximity of the Pantheon. So it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic, it's a fantasy. It's a, it's a rendering that is uh, uh, born from the imagination of, 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 of the artist or the architect. There is something else. This man, Panini, was an architect. I mean, you can see he was obsessed by buildings, but he painted them. And 
you know, you would say, well, you know, we are so different from him. I mean, how, how many architects today consider themselves artists? Well, not too many. I, uh, I asked once in um, Sala Freschel or uh, some students, uh, you know, from big years and asked them, what do you think architecture is an art or not? And they were quite confused. They actually didn't know. They thought, actually, I, I had the feeling that they didn't consider it an art. And, you know, how could you consider it an art if you can, if you try to respond daily to some very prosaic, uh, you know, requirements, the so-called rules and regulations, you know, uh, so the artistic impulse of the architect is dwarfed, is minimized, and and this leads to a blockage. We are we are blocking ourselves actually, and I I think it's very very important, and in fact. You know, someone like Peter Cook, when he was um, the director at Bartlett, a very important architecture school, if not the most important uh, something, was trying to recuperate, to reclaim that connection between architecture and art. And um, in a courageous, non-conventional way. And I, I think that is necessary and very important. Um, Otherwise, we, we die of boredom. Otherwise, we die of excessive rationalism, excessive calculations. You know, the rules and regulations kill architecture in as much as bureaucracy. Uh, this was said by uh, many people, including Einstein, who was not a poet and who was not an artist, but he thought like and felt like an artist and a poet. Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, said, uh, talked about the educated heart. And uh, Le Corbusier, in a similar way, um, uh, stated that uh, the architect must be the best uh, uh, knowing person about artistic matters and so on. But for this, you need a humanistic culture. For this, you need a, a, a different mentality. You know, not a lucrative concern for, uh, you know, prosaic matters. You know, it's, this, is, this, this disturbs me immensely that, you know, in, in our schools of architecture, the history of art is not even studied. How could this be? And then, then how could you have, you know, uh, cultural figures in the field of architecture when in six long years, you don't even study the history of art? Uh, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a big loss. Anyway, let's move, move forward. The capriccio of the rock. Now, capriccio, which is, a, you know, you know what it means. Do we have capriciousness in architecture today? Well, not very often. Why? Because we are rationalists. We think that a capriccio is something uh, uh, unacceptable because we are rational beings, you know, and we cannot uh, have fantasies. But the greatest composers composed, uh, you know, uh, uh, music that uh, that was, um, you know, governed by uh, capriciousness in a, in an elevated way. And I think architecture could too, and in fact, the times did, like for example, the Cosmos Street in Japan, in Tokyo, I think, where um, you know the deconstructivists were invited to build each one of them, um, uh, not a capriccio, but in essence, the same thing, uh, uh, a folly. Even Erasmus of Rotterdam, the great scholar, wrote a book in praise of folly. So, you know, again, it's about reclaiming the role of the, of the heart, the role of imagination, even if sometimes this imagination and the heart, uh, you know, become extravagant, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, you know, uh, time passes and what do we leave behind? Only rationally schemes, you know, dry and boring. That's all, that's all we are capable of doing. You know, anyway, other ruins by Panini. 
by, by Panini, who found this medium to manifest his, uh, cons his interest in architecture and through the art of painting. But, but he was still an architect. And, and he was an architect because you can tell there is not a single picture by him or painting by him without buildings. Ancient Rome, 1757. Uh, we saw we saw a variation of this. <laughs> you know, the ancient Rome is actually painted on the walls. Uh, we see here many things, not just ancient Rome. Like here, we see the you know the great uh, Greek uh, uh, Hellenistic uh, you know sculptural uh, work, and uh, it's it's all the history of art until his time gathered here and the, the connoisseur would recognize many of these things. He was probably also a collector and a dreamer. And uh, what I'm trying to say is even if you don't have clients, even if you are not a good student, even if you are depressed in your room because of a little virus called COVID, you can still draw, you can still paint, you can write a poem, you can write an essay, you can invent a raison d'etre with your imagination. Modern art, modern Rome, sorry, we saw this one. The lottery at Palazzo Montecitorio, Monte now in the National Gallery in London. Again, buildings and buildings and buildings. And uh, Trajan's column there on the right, which should be of some, some interest to us. St. Peter's Basilica from the entrance. Look at this. And he painted it really, I mean, very minutely. You know, every single detail is shown, it's unbelievable. You know, I'm sure if I had a magnifying glass, I would see even the buttons on the coats of the people on the floor. Uh, incredible. I mean, this man worked hard for his paintings, uh, literally. Uh, and uh, well, at that time, there were no cameras, so there was no photography. Goethe said that you only see what you draw. If you don't draw something, you actually do not see it or you didn't see it. I don't know. I mean, what about photography? Goethe didn't know anything about photography. But if you take a picture with a camera, could you say that you actually saw what you took the picture of? Or is it necessary to actually draw it? What would be the difference between drawing something and taking a picture of exactly the same something? What would be the difference? Adoration of the shepherds, adoration of the Magi, uh, the Brooklyn Museum in New York City, now this, even this has architecture. Sorry, the picture is not very clear, uh, but uh, because it is a reflection, I guess it was covered by glass. And anyway, you see again, you know, if you don't move, if you are forced by COVID to stay home, you can take uh, colors, uh, watercolors or oils or whatever, or a pen and begin to draw. And you draw what you see within yourself or you draw what you imagine is outside of yourself. You can do a lot from the stillness of your little room. View of the Colosseum, 1747. And the Colosseum it is. Um, <laughs> was life then better than our life? I don't think so. I'm sure the life then was difficult just as ours is in a different way, but you know, uh, there is a continuum. You know, this, this was uh, a painting uh, by an architect who didn't build, but he, he probably, you know, had dreams of buildings because those who do not build probably dream of buildings even more than those who, who do build. It's possible. German soldiers in 1944 posing with a Panini picture. Because of course the, the soldiers and the colonists and the bankers, you know, they want power, but, but they need culture, they need art. That's why as somebody told me, a banker always talks about art and an artist always talks about money or banks 
because we always talk about what we don't have. So here you will see the German soldiers in 1944, the Second World War. Look at them with a painting by Panini or Paninini. <laughs> Look at the faces of, of the poor soldiers. They are dead now. Maybe they died during the war. Their superiors asked them to bring this painting here. You know, maybe it was an auction or something. Isn't, I mean, this, this photograph to me is very moving because, you know, on one hand, you have the brutality of war. On the other hand, you have the ephemerality of art, you know, and, you know, these soldiers who were prepared to win the war, they actually lost it. They probably lost their lives during that war. And uh, art survives. In that sense, the Latins were right. Ars longa, vita brevis. Art is long, life is short. I think we, 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 we uh, all those people who want to start wars, perhaps should take a minute and look at, at this photograph. You know, what is the relationship between life and art? Um, anyway. A concert given by the Duke of the Nivernais uh, to mark the birth of the Dauphin, 1751. Now look here, you know, uh, I mean, he painted a celebration. Why do we need theater? Why do we need celebrations? Because, uh, because life in itself, by itself, is not sufficient. So then we need, we need creativity, we, 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 creativity. We need the, the madness of, of, of creativity. Ruins of ancient Rome. Other ruins of ancient Rome. So, you know, these paintings move me, you know, because, and I think we can learn from Panini. We can learn to dream, perhaps, to think about the past, but also to think about the future, to imagine different worlds. You know, what, what if, in the solitude of our rooms, we envision a new life, a new city, a new village, a new uh, something, you know, uh, that nobody commissions us to do, but there is value in my opinion in that work. And I think just imagine, you know, I, 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 not every architect, but if a number of architects uh, uh, unemployed or otherwise would use their talent and their imagination to envision uh, a cosmos of hope, a cosmos of hope, which is uh, born from, uh, uh, you know, maybe frustration, maybe, uh, you know, uh, pessimism, maybe optimism. But the idea is to express, as uh, Stephen Hall said, if there is idealism in you, bring it out, express it. Don't keep it within, express it. And I think he was right. Other works by Panini. Uh, <laughs> I kind of envy this, this painter and painters in general, you know, because, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I, 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 I think we impoverished architecture terribly in the name of so-called reality, in the name of so-called rules and regulations. There is no imagination, really. There is no exuberance. Everything is so premeditated and dry and, ah, you know. <laughs> we need badly exuberance, in my opinion. And, and painters, we need the painters. We need them. As Le Corbusier said, I, I said this before, he said, I, 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 I like, I admire, I love painters and engineers, but not architects. Why painters and engineers? Because painters, just like engineers, are focused in, 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 in one direction and, uh, and, uh, and they, uh, they have in a, in a way a certain purity. You know, they are not contaminated. The architect is uh, unavoidably almost a, a prisoner of a compromise. Uh, is, uh, is, of course, there is also a positive uh, aspect of it, that architecture is very complex and, um, you know, uh, in the end, at the end of the day, if you make a good work, 
uh, it encompasses many things. The problem is how could you remain pure? How could you remain yourself when you have to negotiate between various fields? It's not easy. Anyway, Panini or Pian uh, Paninini, an interesting architect who found his, his way uh, of expressing himself through paintings, through drawings, through, you know, uh, it's clearly here an architect because uh, just a painter doesn't paint so many paint, so many buildings and ruins. In general, there are exceptions, of course. Anyway, let's go forward. Look, uh, again, this is almost a fantastic uh, project. You know, he could have he could have projected a, a building in this way. I don't know what it represents. Maybe someone more knowledgeable than me knows. Maybe it was an existing building. I don't know. I never saw it in the pages of history of architecture. But maybe, maybe, maybe it was a real building or maybe not. Maybe it was an imagined building by uh, Panini. Columns, human beings, the sky, the arch, a dog, the water, you know, a crippled man here. This is life. This is life. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, what is really the difference? And then, of course, the ruins, you know, the, the, the empires fall to the ground, the buildings fall to the ground. We have arrows here. We have all kinds of things which didn't actually change. Our attires change, but uh, Life is uh, always, uh, you know, with its drama, with its happenings, with its uh, comedy, with its tragedy. It was, is, and will be kind of the same. Rome, the eternal city, uh, continues to inspire uh, because, yes, it's a very old city and you can see the, the evolution um, and the ruining of, of, of that evolution for many years. Like here, for example, you know, it's it's a collage of famous buildings within Rome. I wonder how he would have built if he if he built, but he didn't. <laughs> Maybe he wouldn't. I, I don't know. But try to imagine uh, Panini opening Ernest Neufer. You know, try, I mean, <laughs> you know, could you could you marry his imagination and his paintings with Ernest Neufer? And I don't know if you know, but Neufer actually was trained at the Bauhaus. Yes, he received the Bauhaus training. And also another surprise, he was a great lover of Antoni Gaudi. Can you imagine Ernest Neufer? Yes, he loved Antoni Gaudi. <laughs> But I don't think that love would have been reciprocated by Gaudi if he knew Neufer. I mean, can you imagine Anthony Gaudi working on his, with, you know, uh, using uh, Ernest Neufer's uh, uh, prescriptions? Uh, I don't think so at all. I'm not against Ernest Neufer. Actually, I think he was an interesting, uh, you know, presence in architecture, but. If we use Neufer as, uh, you know, the, the beginning and the end of architecture, then we impoverish architecture dramatically. Here, you might also say that you see the human foolishness. You know, we, we build these huge structures with great effort, with great expenditures, knowing all too well that one day they will come down and they do come down. But the restlessness of human life and human beings is a reality we cannot uh, get rid of easily. I mean, look at this uh, sumptuous spaces. Look at, the, look at the size of the human beings. They are minuscule, lost almost in this incredible, you know, you know large spaces. I look at a, st a statue and look at a so-called real human being. You know, it's 
indeed ars longa vita brevis the humans are like little insects almost you know lost in this large large space so so his painting is in a, in a way is a commentary on the dialectics between art and life ruins ruins again and here <laughs> well you know i can look at this picture for a long time and uh, and wonder you know is life just a dream as it was said it probably is as uh, as uh, strindberg said quoted by uh, a character in funny and alexander by ingmar bergman uh, space and time do not exist i guess i guess um, maybe it's all maybe we are dreaming we are living you know and uh, what do we see here a spectacle of huge dimensions you know i mean uh, and things didn't change actually you know uh, yes we have uh, different buildings yes we have different shows but in essence the activity the artistic activity and the consumption of the artistic activity remained approximately the same. Panini. San Pietro. Piazza Navona. Piazza Navona apparently had a lake here uh, around that time, you know. And uh, yeah, Bernini. And then this church uh, contributed to it uh, also uh, Boromini and Bernini, the glory of, of Rome.
we saw this one. The Pantheon again. Okay, and now we go to the second, uh, I guess we could say the second architect, Panini was an architect as well who painted. Now, uh, German architect who died on the 21st of October, uh, Johann Konrad Schlaun. Uh, and uh, let's see, Schlaun built, and uh, he built, uh, you know, appreciably. Here he was uh, with an interesting nose. Um, already, I mean, you know, you can compare. We saw the portrait of Panini, and now we see the portrait of uh, Mr. Schlaun. Uh, here is a sculpture, a statue uh, represented him, I think, in front of a school which is uh, which bears its name uh, in Germany. Johann Konrad Schlaun. A Baroque master, uh, a master of, of Baroque architecture, a Baumeister, as you can see on this stamp. How many of you, well, we have five people with me included here, but how many people imagine today that one day they will make it to be on a stamp? Uh, not many. Anyway. Uh, it seems that uh, the sunlight or the sun ray uh, lapped um, uh, the architect's nose. Now, uh, a church from 1724 to 1728. Uh, here it is. And, uh, he, you know, it is Baroque, but mainly inside, because outside, with the exception of uh, the top part, they try to imagine the building without this part, and it's rather austere and not really Baroque. But the inside, um, I don't have pictures from the inside, but I have other, other, other buildings by him where I show the inside as well. Another Kirche, another church, 1744, 45, 1753. Here already the Baroque uh, came out of, of the building and uh, you know it's present here he is a very important german architect uh, an architect I, I didn't know anything about until i uh, discovered his name uh, as being uh, you know an architect born uh, who died on the 21st of october uh, this is a, a building from 1753 I like this building, you know, and 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 uh, uh, I don't know exactly its function, you know, it, it's something rural about it, but it's whimsical, and I think it's interesting. And I think uh, uh, I hope I have other pictures here. I suggest an ad memoir with with his creations. I hope I have other images on this presentation with this particular building, which I like. You see how much you can do with brick. Of course, you need some good craftsmen to do this. Uh, but uh, everything is done with brick. And the uh, capriciousness uh, of, of, of design is, uh, is a plus. Because without this capriciousness, this facade would be 
uh, you know, without architectonic poetry. But like this, it does have it. Uh, you know, again, the rationalist would say, why is this necessary to, to, to have here, I don't know, 170 degrees or, or 172 or whatever. Why couldn't he, he had, why didn't he have it, you know, flat all the way? Well, you know, it's because he, he, he wanted to bring some sensitivity, some sensibility to the building. And I think he achieved it in, in this bit, rather modest building, but I think it's a nice building. Another, another building, this is an urban, um, you know, uh, secular building. You see here the crown at the top, what can we say? You know, there are such buildings even in Romania. A uh, cluster, a cluster. Um, I, I like his his buildings because they are they are urban, but there is also something I think connecting to an extent, at least with the uh, rurality. Uh, a schloss. It's a it's a it's a, it's a castle, uh, large building and. Uh, what can we say? This was not for everybody. Well, now the tourists, of course, visit it, I imagine, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an imposing, it's a large building. It's a building uh, built for, uh, built for uh, those who you know, were able to afford it, so to speak, for an elite, maybe the king, or I don't know. Um, but that king is dead. So it doesn't matter, you know, you, you are a proletarian or a peasant or a king. The end is the same, is absolutely the same. Uh, another kirche, another church and, and chapel. Uh, I like more the chapel than the church, but uh, an interesting architect actually. And I think he deserves, I couldn't find too many pictures with his work, but um, what I see here, I like, you see, uh, just an elevation, a front elevation, but it has complexity and it has plastic qualities. Uh, maybe Panini would have felt inspired to paint it. Uh, I don't know what this is, garden house. It's a, it's a building inside the garden. Uh, maybe the, the gardener lived here. Uh, I, uh, I think we need more gardeners in the world and not engineers, but humanists, artists, gardeners. We have, uh, you know, training for, uh, um, for uh, you know, at horticulture. Uh, we, we train engineers to handle uh, plants, but uh, I, <laughs> this also says something about us that, that it doesn't even cross our mind to, 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 to train gardeners who are artists and humanists and poets and not engineers. It doesn't even cross our mind. And this is alarming, I think. Anyway, uh, Jesuit uh, college or whatever it is here. Yeah, I guess. And Jesuit it is. Rather stern, but... Uh, Still, uh, I would say a, a good building, you know, maybe more than just decent. Uh, another church, but this one, no, Schloss, North Kirchen, uh, Schloss is not a church. I don't know German, unfortunately, but, uh, and it doesn't look like a church, but I like this building uh, somehow, you know, for a secular building, it has. Uh, even a certain roundness somehow, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, I think he was able to modulate uh, interestingly this, uh, this view of the, of the main facade. Yeah. Schlaun, the Schloss, another Schloss from uh, 1725. Um, Yes, you can tell this is uh, this is Germany. But even this building, you know, it's 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 there is more here. I, I think I think the Baroque sensibility is, is something we should uh, reconsider. 
you know, even at the time of so-called uh, sustainability, you know, because you, if you allow the workers and the architect uh, to indulge in uh, certain, uh, you know, artistic elements relating to the to building, I think uh, maybe we can uh, we can talk again about an architecture which is not stereotypical and banal. Um, another schloss. Look at it, you know. I mean, you say it's, it, this is nonsense or it's amusing, you know. What are these things here doing here? Why why did he need them here? Well, you know, if you ask this question in the history about the history of architecture, you would eliminate, uh, you know, maybe maybe ninety percent of all the buildings built which needed ornament. And uh, I'm not saying that these are very inspired here. They seem to be kind of, you know, attached to the walls. They didn't grow out of the walls as Sullivan would have required, but still, you know, it's an attempt to, to, to bring some sensibility to a building which otherwise maybe in his conception would have been a little rough or austere. Uh, this is a square with some buildings around it. I don't know exactly what he did here. I should learn German before it is too late and it is already late, but uh, this is a nice square actually. And the buildings around it are nice too. I don't know exactly what he did, but uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, an urban place without the interest. No, it's not, it's, it's well done. Clown. And here is a land house. What is this? Another building. Uh, you see, you see the oblongs, and I really think there is a future for oblongs. I think we should bring them back to our buildings. But of course, you cannot have oblongs on the using the horizontal band, the windows that uh, Le Corbusier with ardor advocated. You need. Uh, or there you can have the oblongs, uh, the superior part and the inferior part above and below the window, but th that is strange. Now, maybe we should return and, and strangely, I, I show that uh, Le Corbusier himself in his little so-called studio near Le Cabanon had a window almost identical with what we see here. And for such vertical individual uh, windows, we can use oblongs. And all oblongs are very useful. You protect uh, your, your room from the noise, from maybe excessive uh, sunlight. Uh, they are very useful. And even aesthetically, if they are done creatively, I think they could uh, uh, mean something for the elevation of a building. Another Schloss and Schloss it is. Um, and everybody seems to enjoy uh, life here in front of the building. Nice, and the building is not white. Is Villa Savoie better than this building? Uh, I don't know, I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound cynical, but uh, what can I say? This is a building without glory, perhaps. We know that it's done by this architect, but uh, there is the chance, and there would have been the chance that uh, nobody would have cared who designed it. And still, it stands. It stands and it's colorful and it receives the sunlight uh, with pleasure. Another church, but here he did just this uh, uh, piece, uh, you know. We can think now of the paintings of Panini or Paninini. Maybe if he saw this, he would have painted it, it's possible. He built a lot, this architect, that I knew nothing of until uh, some, some time ago.
This makes me think of the house and the tower where the great uh, German poet Hölderlin lived after he lost his mind, so to speak. He became ill and uh, I think a carpenter or uh, yeah, took him into his house and he lived for many years, Hölderlin, um, in, a, in a room, in a tower, very similar to this one. When I first saw the image of this, I thought it was the uh, the building where Hölderlin lived, but I, I don't think it is. But it's it's very similar, an idyllic uh, place indeed. Other buildings by this architect, this German architect. I miss, to be honest, to do these kind of windows, you know, with small square. Uh, well, maybe not entirely square. Uh, uh, pieces of glass, so-called traditional windows, but I, I think they have a, I don't know, this fragmentation of the glass and of the window uh, is a positive thing. I'm tired of those huge pieces of glass. No, these are more sensitive, more human somehow. And uh, if a piece breaks, uh, okay, you replace the little piece, you don't replace the whole window. I am tired of uh, thermal panels, they are called here, you know, uh, really. And look at the inside, my God, my God. I keep on wondering what, what, I mean, these people had nothing else to do but spend their lives painting, uh, you know, such, you know, complex work on, uh, on, 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 a, on, a, on a curved ceiling. Uh, they must have been from a different race, not humans like us. Schlaun, a good architect, and he made it to on a post on a, on a stamp. So obviously he was and is recognized. I actually like Baroque art and Baroque architecture. Um, I think he did also landscape uh, design, uh, I mean, in gardening. Now, you know, uh, the functionalist and the purist, purist would protest, would say, what is this nonsense here? or this nonsense here, you know, the, or this nonsense here, or the here, you know, why, 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 and why again? Well, you could ask also in the case of Palladio, why, why does he have sculptures and statues at the top of his buildings? You know, we can ask many things, but the brick is brick. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was right in this case when he said, give me a, a, a brick and I will transform it into its equivalent in gold. He understood the, 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 the importance, the value of one brick, one single brick. So, you know, Today, no one would do such a window, no one. But, but I, th I think it's a loss. Why shouldn't we, you know? Uh, why shouldn't we lose ourselves in contemplation like a child when playing in the sand by designing something, you know, in a certain way, not, not copying what is here, but allowing uh, ourselves to be more dreamy, to be, to be more capricious, yes, but essentially more uh, creative and to find pleasure. I don't think too many architects today work with pleasure because we are too dry, too rational, too, you know, so-called scientific and objective. My God, my God, I don't know who this man is. I don't know what he is doing here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Yeah. 
So we are now in Germany, not in Italy. We have seen Panini and now we see Mr. Schlaun, the, the important Baroque German uh, architect. And still the, this house is, uh, is uh, he repeated this kind of uh, a few times. I think they, they, it has a gracefulness though, the facade that uh, deserves some, some, uh, some study, I think. Now, is this Richard Serra uh, in front of uh, the, I think it is, the sculpture, the statue. The, no, no, I shouldn't call it statue. The sculpture is by Richard Serra, the North American uh, modern sculptor. And I like this uh, juxtaposition between the old and the new. You have the new and then behind you have the old here you have the Baroque, here you have some kind of monumental minimalism, uh, but uh, in the dialectics of art and life, uh, I think it's important to attempt to bring together the old and the new. Like here, you know, this is, this is too much, you know, the, the minimalist to die here would have a heart attack, would uh, collapse would uh, vomit, would, uh, would scream, would say, take me away from here. This is not for me. I cannot bear to see this nonsense. But, you know, not everybody thought like this and thinks like this. No, there are people who love this, you know, and uh, <laughs> we can talk about it, you know. Is it ugly what we look at? Is it uh, mad what we look at? Uh, our, our white walls, uh, you know, uh, less mad. Uh, we can debate. This is more than Baroque. This is already, I would say, uh, Rococo. It is, it is obsessive. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it is a little bit mad and maddening, but, but some uh, people uh, at that time enjoyed it. Anyway, we are approaching the end of this presentation, another Schloss. Quite regular otherwise, it's not, I mean, you know, this man is, was, was not without uh, rhythm and rigor and even some, you know, so-called objectivity. Here is another uh, castle by him and uh, I wouldn't mind living here if, if it was offered to me a room or two, uh, even one would do very well. Are we wiser now than at his time? I, I am not sure, I don't think so. Maybe, no, but I cannot say they were better than us. It's just, it was a different kind of life and uh, the building shows it. Johann Konrad Schlaun. This was the, and this is the architect that we presented today, Johann Konrad Schlaun. Johann Konrad Schlaun, again, the castle, hit by uh, the elements, by the snow in this case, still resisting, you know, for uh, more than 250 years. This is a building which I always liked by him. I mean, always after I discovered this architect. I don't know its function though. It's possible it had a very, you know, maybe a, a place for uh, horses or something. I don't know, but it's architecture. It could not have been a garage because at that time there were no cars, nor is it a home.
Thank you.